After a few moments of silent prayer, then I will um, open in prayer. I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to make sure they're in fellowship and ready to study the Word. And then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so very grateful that we can come together this evening to focus upon your word. Father, we're reminded that it is important for us to live our life day by day, moment by moment, in dependence upon you, trusting in you through your word, and it is through your word that you communicate to us, and on the basis of the promises and the principles and the statements of your word that we can uh, learn about you and trust in you as we face the various challenges of life. Father, we pray for folks in this congregation who are facing some significant challenges. Some involve health, some involve business, some involve other aspects of life. And we pray for them and pray that you would strengthen them and they might be a real testimony to your grace. And we pray that you might truly intercede in their lives with mercy uh, to help resolve some of the challenging problems that some folks are facing. And Father, we just pray that tonight as we study your word, you might help us to think through these issues in terms of their own application and significance in our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, where the Apostle Paul <clears throat> comes to Ephesus. This is a lengthy chapter, a lengthy time here. He spent two to two and a half years in Ephesus establishing a school and uh, <clears throat> where he taught and then uh, sent out missionaries throughout the Roman province of Asia, which is in western Turkey. And that established all those churches we read about, in some of them in the seven letters to the uh, uh, seven churches there at the beginning of Revelation, as well as some others that are not mentioned there, churches in Colossae, churches in Laodicea, churches in Smyrna and Sardis and Thyatira, Pergamum, All of these churches were established during this period of time as Paul trained uh, pastors and trained uh, men in the ministry in Ephesus, and then they went out witnessing and established uh, churches in all of these and many other other locations. Paul arrives in September of 53, uh, give or take a few months, but that seems to be the best way to sort this out chronologically. He arrives in September of 53, and this is near the beginning of his third missionary journey. He returned at the end of the second missionary journey to Jerusalem, and um, Luke just gives us a a brief travelogue as he goes from Jerusalem up to Antioch, visits the brethren there, and then leaves, goes across uh, southern Galatia, which is south-central Turkey today, goes across that area and makes his way to Ephesus, which will be his uh, uh, basic operating uh, center for the next uh, two and a half years. Now, we read at the beginning of Acts 19.1 that it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. We read it and studied about Apollos the last time, and Apollos had uh, known a little bit about Jesus, but he didn't know that Jesus had died for his, for his sins. He didn't know uh, all of the gospel events yet. He had been teaching in Ephesus when Aquila uh, and Priscilla recognized his, his gifts, his abilities, that he knew the truth, but not all of it. It's that we went over the doctrine of transition the last time. We see more of that transition uh, here when Paul meets these 12 disciples uh, from John the Baptist. Now, transition is a category when we're going through Acts that some people have had some difficulty with. I went through it in detail last time. Just to remind you, there's a clear dispensational break, but communication takes time, and there's a fading out of certain aspects related to Israel, not issues related to salvation or sanctification, but issues related to, for example, the temple still is in operation until God ends the temple worship, which will occur in A.D. 70. And so there are these kinds of transitions that are going on, and you still have a number of people who are Old Testament saints, or in the case of these disciples in Acts 19, 
They are disciples of John the Baptist. They don't have as much information as Apollos had. Apollos had more information than they did because at least he had heard about Jesus and knew some things about Jesus' life, but he didn't know anything about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension until Aquila and Priscilla uh, uh, took him aside and explained the details of the crucifixion and the completion of the plan of salvation uh, to him on the side. Now he's left Ephesus and he's gone to Corinth to become a, the pastor there. And what we see here is a principle that there doesn't seem to be only one pastor per congregation because you have in various places here uh, different pastors coming along in different congregations. In Ephesus, we're going to see Paul. We're going to see Timothy later on. We're going to see uh, uh, John, the apostle, who becomes known in Ephesus as John the Elder. All of these men pastored in this area. And so there's uh, the plan of God is never dependent upon one person, one individual. There are some highly gifted uh, pastors, there are some that are not as gifted. Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the spiritual gifts are given according to the measure of the Holy Spirit. So there's, there's different, um, uh, you know, different strengths, as it were, to, their, uh, to everybody's spiritual gifts. Some have the gift of evangelism to a much greater degree than others. Some have the gift of teaching or gift of pastoring to a greater degree uh, than others. But God uses these gifted men in different ways at different times uh, for different congregations. Now, Apollos has left. He's gone to Corinth, and Paul has come to Ephesus, and there we read that he finds some disciples. Now, a disciple is one of those holy words that is used a lot, and people uh, think it means something that it doesn't. And often people sort of get confused about what it means. It's a simple Greek word, methetes, which means a student, a learner, somebody who is a dedicated follower to some teacher. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a believer in Jesus Christ. These men were, didn't, hadn't even heard about Jesus Christ yet. They're called disciples, but they're students of the word. And they were followers of John the Baptist. And so these are the ones that... Paul runs into finding some disciples, and we would probably translate that a participle there. Uh, when he found these disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he wants to clarify that they've actually entered into the church age Christian life because they don't have it yet. And so he's asking if they had received the Holy Spirit when they believe. So the, one of the first things we see when we get into this section is a focus on God, the role of God the Holy Spirit, the unique role of God the Holy Spirit in the spiritual life of the church age believer. This was distinct from Old Testament believers. They did not have the, the Holy Spirit in the way we do in the church age. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon uh, Old some Old Testament believers, but I've gone through all the Old Testament. You've got to make a little, little uh, uh, approximation for most of the writers of, of the Old Testament. We don't know how many there were. There were others who were in leadership that were recipients of the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, not too many. And as far as I've been able to figure out, over a period of 2,000 years, you had fewer than 100 people in the Old Testament who had any kind of relationship with God the Holy Spirit. That relationship that they had was re related to their leadership, uh, their leadership ability and their leadership responsibilities in Israel. They had nothing to do with the spiritual lives of those individuals. When you get into the book of Judges, we notice that many of the judges, such as uh, Gideon and Jephthah and Samson, uh, were energized and empowered to do to perform their role as a judge by the Holy Spirit, but their spiritual lives were failures. They were as pagan and operated many times uh, in as horrible a way as any of the Canaanites around them. That was the part of the point that the writer of Judges was making. But God, the Holy Spirit, enabled them to fulfill a particular leadership role and function. 
So they're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit in any way like the New Testament believer. And the Holy Spirit could be given and could be taken away. For example, with King Saul, the Holy Spirit left King Saul. He received the Holy Spirit uh, when he was anointed to be king and to enable him in his kingly function. So the Holy Spirit is, as it were, enabling, strengthening, influencing him. What words do I just use? Enabling, strengthening, influencing him. Think about what we talked about on Thursday night last, last week in, in Romans when we were talking about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart was like strengthening, but it's influence. It's not a determinative thing like you have uh, where, where the volition is taken over. The Holy Spirit, even in the New Testament with the filling of the Spirit, is not where the Holy Spirit takes over the volition of an individual. It just, he influences, encourages, strengthens somebody's will in a particular direction, but they can still go, no, I'm going to be obstinate and stubborn and go my own way. And so this idea of, of encouraging, strengthening, hardening, that, that those words that were used for Pharaoh's heart are also used in other passages in relation to God strengthening a believer. In those passages, we never think that he's locking down their volition. He's just encouraging it. So it's the same kind of idea. And so in the Old Testament, you have that kind of a ministry in relation to leadership. And this is why David, after his uh, sin with Bathsheba, after his uh, conspiracy to take the life of Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, he prayed that God would not take his Holy Spirit from him because he had sinned. And when he confessed his sin, he prayed, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. His, he knew that God had taken the spirit away from Saul, his predecessor, and so David is praying that God would not do that. Now, that prayer is not, not a relevant prayer for the church age because we're not under that kind of a ministry of God the Holy Spirit. The ministry of God the Holy Spirit is a permanent indwelling ministry for every single believer from the instant of salvation, and we all receive the Holy Spirit at the instant of salvation. But in the early church, that didn't happen to every believer. Remember, we started off we, on, on the day of Pentecost, and we had, prime, first of all, the disciples uh, receive the Holy Spirit, and there was a sign that went along with that, and that was that they spoke in uh, foreign languages. And then uh, there's a subsequent event that took place with the Samaritan believers, and when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it was after they had been saved. It wasn't at the minute they trusted in Christ. It was after they were saved when John and Peter had come up from Jerusalem to Samaria and had laid hands on them. Then they received God the Holy Spirit, but they didn't speak in tongues. Then, uh, later on, when you get to Cornelius, when Peter took the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, what happened? Uh, when they believed, the, they, the Holy Spirit fell upon them at that point, just like at the day of Pentecost, and they spoke in tongues. Now, this is the fourth event of that type, and it involves these disciples of John the Baptist who are uh, not church-age believers yet, but they are Old Testament saints, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit. So Paul is trying to clarify this. Uh, by his interrogation, he says, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So they are completely ignorant about the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. So Paul has to teach them. And so as further, uh, as further inquiry, in verse 3, he says, Well, wait a minute. Into what baptism, into what then were you baptized? Into what then were you baptized? Now, we're going to get into a study of baptism tonight because this is one of those central passages that discusses uh, where we see the significance of baptism in the early church. And the word baptism actually in, in the Greek means to immerse in something. That's its, that's its <clears throat> uh, literal meaning. But it has a figurative sense that it is often used for, and that is to indicate uh, indicate identification with something. Something is literally plunged or immersed into something else in order to identify those things together. And so Paul is, is asking, what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism, the baptism of John, uh, John the Baptist, which wasn't 
the baptism of Jesus. It wasn't the baptism of, of uh, it wasn't believer's baptism. It was a baptism of repentance, which Paul clarifies in verse 4. He says, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. Now, what kind of baptism was John's baptism? It was a water baptism by immersion. In, in Israel, in Israel, in their history, especially in the Second Temple period, there were a number of different washings. These washings involved complete immersion, and they were, they were for the purpose of demonstrating uh, ritual cleanliness. And, for example, if you go on the southern steps of the temple, there are somewhere around uh, between 30 and 50 uh, mikvaot, that's the plural. Mikvah is the singular. A mikvah was a was like a bit large stone uh, bathtub that would be about six feet, six or seven feet wide, and maybe uh, ten or twelve feet uh, deep. And there would be a two uh, two sets of stairs that would have a small stone divider between them. And someone coming to the temple to worship must make sure that they are ritually cleansed before they worship. We make sure that we are spiritually clean before we worship, so we confess our sins. That's what this whole function of washing represented. It was a ritual demonstration of a spiritual truth, that before a person could worship God, the sin problem had to be dealt with. And so there was this physical imagery of washing, of cleansing. And so they would uh, have on a... Uh, a, usually a white robe, and they would go down into the water, walk down the steps on one side, that's the unclean side, and then they would get down there, but they couldn't wear the same robe out, so they would change to a clean robe, and they would come out. It was a white robe indicating purity, and they would come up the other side of the stairs so they wouldn't be defiled by walking where they had walked going down on the one side, and they would come out, and they would completely immerse themselves in the water, and this was a picture of spiritual cleansing. It's ritual cleansing. And so that was the, the this had been part of, of Israel's heritage in the temple. Well, John is using that same thing going out into uh, the uh, area along the Jordan, and he is baptizing people uh, and immersing them in the uh, waters of the Jordan. And it is a baptism, though, that ha- that significance is it's identifying the people with repentance. Going back to the principle of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 2, where God said that if, or that when Israel turns, a teshuvah turns back to God, then God will recover all of the scattered uh, Jews from around the world and restore them to their land and establish the kingdom. And so this was John's message to um, uh, proclaim the uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so the sign that they were identifying with John's message of repentance and with the kingdom was that they would, uh, they would be baptized. So its, its picture was one of identification with something. And it also has the idea of inauguration into this new life. So if you just think about the letter I, you have inauguration and you have, um, uh, you, you have, <clears throat> you have um, um, what did I say, uh, inauguration and what? Immer- immersion, no, that's a good word, I, immersion, inauguration, and um, uh, as they are, are inaugurated or identified, that's the word, identified, uh, immersion, identification, inauguration, three I's, and they're, they're identified uh, with repentance. And so <clears throat> notice uh, Paul says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. And so that is a reference to Jesus Christ. We'll look at that passage a little bit later on in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. So that is a focus on the gospel. Notice it's not believe and be baptized to get saved, but they were baptized that they might in the future, when the one who came after him came along, believe on him. Now, in verse 5, Paul says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is what distinguishes believer's baptism, Christian believer's baptism, from the baptism of John the Baptist, uh, 
and the baptism of Christ. You'll often hear in some circles that we are to, quote, follow the Lord in baptism. Well, the Lord's baptism, as we'll see, had nothing to do with either John's baptism or believer's baptism, because John's baptism had to do with uh, identification with repentance. Jesus had nothing to repent of. Believer's baptism is a picture of our identification uh, and union with Christ. Uh, that does not apply to Christ. So his was more for inauguration. It was the inauguration of his, of his public ministry. But it's distinguished by the fact that he is, um, uh, be, that, that he says they were to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what's interesting here is in September of 53, when he's arrived, we don't know, uh, this is probably near the beginning of his, of his time in uh, Ephesus, but it's not long after this when Paul receives a, a letter from Corinth describing various problems in Corinth, and also attached to it is a list of questions. One of the first things that Paul deals with with the Corinthians is that they have a problem of divisiveness. They're arrogant. They're choosing up sides. I followed this pastor. I followed that pastor. And then you had the the, the holiness crowd. They were better and, and more spiritual than anybody else, and they followed Jesus. So you had people who followed Peter, others who followed Paul, some who followed Apollos, and then the holy crowd followed Jesus. But it was all wrong, and, and, and that's where Paul makes a statement in 1 Corinthians 1. He said he'd be baptized two or three of them, but he said, I thank God I didn't baptize more. And he wasn't saying because baptism isn't important. He's saying it's because I don't want to be used uh, and be a part of your nasty little self-absorbed arrogant games. And I don't want to use you, you to use what I did in order to further your agenda. He's not saying baptism wasn't right because at, at the same time that Paul is castigating the Corinthians for using baptism as a means of dividing people, he is personally baptizing these 12 uh, disciples of John the Baptist in Ephesus. So Paul is totally consistent. He's not, there's, there's no basis for saying that Paul is phasing out baptism uh, at all. When it's understood correctly, it continues as the sign of the church age. So when Paul laid hands on them, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So we see that there's something significant that takes place. And they received the Holy Spirit, not when they believe. First they believed when they heard the gospel related to Jesus. Then they were baptized by water in the name of Jesus. And then Paul laid hands on them. And th then they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and prophesied. So in each of these events, a Pentecost, the Samaritan Pentecost, uh, the uh, salvation of Gen the Gentiles in Cornelius' household, and then here in Ephesus, there's a different order of events. That's a key point in understanding this, that the Pentecostal doctrine that came into the 20th century, uh, which taught that, uh, that speaking in tongues was the only and necessary sign of being baptized by the Holy Spirit, was completely false because it had a it, it took as a it took this as normative and it took the pattern as normative that first you're saved and then time goes by and then you get the second blessing and you speak in tongues and that shows you've been baptized by the Spirit. But Acts shows that there's a different pattern, different order of events, and the Samaritans didn't speak in tongues. It was only the Jews, the Gentiles, and then these Old Testament saints that spoke in tongues. So nothing here is normative, nothing's setting a pattern. It's all demonstrating something, though, about a major shift that is occurring in relation to God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the Gentiles. And this is all tied up around the doctrine of baptism and the role of God the Holy Spirit. So we're going to take some time to go through the doctrine of baptism to make sure we understand it. Now, for some of you, this is this is uh, your second or third time around through some of this material. There's some material I cover sometimes, other stuff I leave out at other times. And 
Others of you have never heard this, so we need to go through it in detail. First of all, it's always good to start with the definition. A lot of uh, disagreement, a lot of misunderstanding always is avoided if we just def define our terms. The English word baptize is not an English word. It is a transliteration because the Reformers were cowards, basically. Uh, the Reformers were cowards, and they didn't want to translate the word immerse because by the time you got to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, remember the Protestant Reformation began on October the 31st, All Saints' Eve, All Saints' Day was a, one of those special days that they observe on the, on the Roman Catholic calendar. And on All Saints' Eve, Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk, uh, who did not seek to do anything more than to reform some of the practices, some of the abuses in the Roman Catholic Church, nailed 95 disputation points to the local bulletin board, which was the front door of the local church. Uh, they didn't have uh, a lot of uh, social media at the time, email, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, they had the front door of the church. And so he nails these 95 debating points to the front door of the church, and he wants to debate, and essentially they all relate to this whole issue of somehow working or earning uh, grace. Well, the Roman Catholic Church had been practicing infant baptism by sprinkling since about the 4th or 5th century. In fact, infant baptism sort of, uh, sort of seeped into the church, you might say, uh, pun intended, uh, in the... Um, or about the mid-2nd century, and it was wrapped up with all matter of confusion. And they would take, if you were a new convert and you wanted to be baptized just to make sure you were serious, they would put you through a, a catechism class to learn basic doctrine for two and a half years, and then they would test you and watch your life and observe you to see if you were really qualified to be baptized. And then they would go through a whole series of rituals prior to your baptism, including an exorcism and a renunciation of Satan and a number of other things uh, that varied from region to region before you were baptized. And by the middle of the second century, they had gotten into this idea that somehow baptism itself literally washed away your sins. This is why later on, it's a well-known story about uh, Emperor Constantine, that he was uh, quite a sinner and he didn't want to be baptized, even though he had become a Christian. He didn't want to be baptized until he was pretty sure he was going to die because he wanted to make sure that most of his sins were going to get washed away in baptism. But this is the kind of thinking they had in the early church. <coughs> so they had... Typical Houston congestion. Um, so they had these, these various views, and they started baptizing infants around this same time, so that by the time you get to about the 5th or 6th century, infant baptism became the norm, and by then it had become, uh, uh, usually the mode was sprinkling. So the battleground over baptism had always been the age, when are you baptized, uh, is it upon uh, admission of your faith in Christ, or can you be baptized as a child? The mode of baptism, immersion or sprinkling. And then after Christianity was legalized by Emperor Constantine, entry into the church became identified with becoming a citizen of the state, so that if you're a good Roman citizen, you're a good Christian. And once you confuse those things together, then later on, after several uh, several centuries, later on, if you were to question the legitimacy of infant baptism, it was like questioning somebody's birth certificate, their allegiance to the state, their identification as a citizen. This is why when you get into the Protestant Reformation, and there were several stages of the Protestant Reformation. There was the German Lutheran stage that started in 1517. And then within a year or two of that, you have the uh, French-Swiss uh, Reformation and then the German-Swiss Reformation. And then a little bit later, you had the English and Scottish Reformation. 
But in the German-Swiss Reformation that was led by Ulrich Zwingli, uh, he had a couple of um, a couple of young men that came up under him who came under what was known as Anabaptist convictions. Now, bapto, baptism became a, a Latinized word also brought over from Greek. Anna means again. And these were people who believed, okay, so what, you were baptized as an infant. Once you became a, an adult and believed in Christ, you needed to be, receive believer's baptism. You needed to be baptized again. So they were called Anabaptists, and they emphasized baptism by immersion. And many of these Anabaptists also had some really strange ideas. Uh, they did not, of course, they believed in separation of church and state. In fact, uh, a good trivia question for you to ask somebody sometime, especially if you know somebody who's a died in the wool Baptist, ask them, what makes a Baptist a Baptist? And I've asked many Baptist preachers this. I've asked many Southern Baptists this uh, question, and none of them have ever gotten this right. There are two things that make a Baptist a Baptist, and the only person that I've ever had a discussion with about this it happened in the, um, I think it was like the First Baptist Church of Mystic, Connecticut, and a friend of mine who was a, a Jewish urologist who was an agnostic, and I were walking through, you know who I'm talking about, we were walking through this, this old church in Mystic, and I said, I said, um, I bet you don't know what makes a Baptist a Baptist. He said, yeah, two things. They believe in baptism by immersion and separation of church and state. That's it. Nothing about Jesus. Nothing about the Bible, nothing about inerrancy. What makes a Baptist a Baptist is a belief in separation of church and state and baptism by immersion, period. And most Baptists don't know that. Most Baptist theologians don't know that. So, But that's what makes a Baptist a Baptist. And so there were the, these various leaders who had been trained by uh, Zwingli, and yet they, because they held to a literal interpretation of Scripture, they were pushing it further than Zwingli did, and they believed in baptism by immersion, and so he held a trial of heresy. They were all convicted because, you see, this had political overtones. If you say that their original infant baptism had no value, then they're not a member of the state. They're not a good citizen. So this mixture of, of church and state had, had many ramifications. And so they, they were declared her, not only heretics, but treasonous heretics. They were traitors to the state. And so for their belief in immersion, ironically enough, they were executed by drowning. So there have been a lot of battles fought over the whole issue of, of, uh, of baptism and a lot of misunderstanding. But baptism as a, it came into English during that time. Rather than translating it as immers, immersion, your translators, uh, for example, William Tyndale, uh, you could go back further to John Wycliffe, uh, William Tyndale, others who were involved in the translation of the Geneva Bible, then later the King James uh, Bible, the authorized version, rather than translating baptizo as immersion, they just took the coward's way out and transliterated it. That way they avoided all of the uh, arguments and all of the, the uh, uh, disagreement. But baptizo in the Greek means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. And there are many uses of, of this word that you can find down through the uh, down through the centuries, as you find uh, different writers who use them to describe different things. For example, in the fourth century BC, Xenophon used it to describe uh, new recruits who had just graduated from basic training in the Spartan army would take their spears and dip them into a, uh, a bucket of pig's blood to identify, see there's that significance again, to identify their spear with death and, and, and with blood. Blood signified death. And we've studied that in relationship to the phrase the blood of Christ. It's a, it's a term meaning the death of Christ. So they would identify their spears now with death as they would prepare to go into battle. In the 5th century, Euripides uh, used it to describe a ship sinking being immersed into the ocean. Uh, 
Uh, and so it also indicated a change of the nature of the ship as it's now uh, being identified with the water so that it can no longer float. So as an action, uh, <coughs> baptism it signifies identification with something, with an action, a person, or an object, and indicates a new status in life, the inauguration into a new status. So immersion, identification, and um, uh, uh, inauguration are the three key terms to use in relationship to baptism. Now, a lot of times when people hear the word baptism, they think about water. But there are eight total baptisms in the New Testament. Five of them are what are called real baptisms. A uh, real baptism is one that it signifies a, a true changing status or condition, and these are dry, uh, whereas three of the baptisms in the New Testament are ritual baptisms, and they're all wet. So you have dry baptisms and wet baptisms, five real baptisms, and three wet baptisms. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the three uh, ritual or water baptisms. These are the ones that are most familiar to everybody, so we'll skip through those fairly quickly. The first is the baptism of Jesus. This is a unique baptism. It's identifying him with the plan of God, and it is inaugurating him into his uh, ministry as prophet, priest, and king uh, to Israel. And so the key verse for that is Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17, which we'll look at in a minute. The second ritual baptism is the baptism of John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance uh, toward God, repentance uh, in relation to God's plan, and uh, repentance in relation to the kingdom of heaven. This is described in Matthew 3, 1 through 11. Notice they're all in Matthew 3. Since we just started a series in Matthew, we'll be getting there probably uh, not, not too far distant in our study in Matthew. Third, the baptism of believers. This is mentioned in Acts 2, 38 and 41, Matthew 8, I mean Acts 8, 36 to 38. That's the Ethiopian eunuch. And what did they say? Immediately... That he wanted to be baptized. He didn't go through this two-and-a-half-year period where he's trained in basic doctrine, goes through the catechism, goes through exorcism, goes through uh, all kinds of anointings and washings and everything else. It's just immediate right there on the spot. And, of course, the key verse for believer's baptism is Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples. We'll look at that in a minute. Now, just a summary here, the five real or dry baptisms are, first of all, the baptism of Noah. I'm going to come back. We're going to look at each of these passages in our study. The baptism of Noah is described in 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. Then there's the baptism of Moses, described in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. Then there's the baptism of fire, uh, also described in Matthew 3, 11 uh, through 12. Then there's the, ba uh, the baptism of the cross, which is mentioned in Mark 10, 38 to 39. And finally, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Eight different baptisms, three, uh, three wet, five dry. So let's look at these. Here's a passage for Jesus' baptism. Jesus came from Galilee, that would be up in the north, uh, came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized uh, by him. And John tried to prevent him. See, John's thinking at this point, John's thinking, he's not, not a sinner, he doesn't need to repent. Okay, so he tries to prevent him. And Jesus said, I need to be baptized by you and uh, or, or no, John says to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? And, you know, he's questioning this. Why are you coming to me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And so John baptizes Jesus, and this is when God the Father speaks from heaven and says, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And he says, and then God the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove. This is the inauguration of Jesus' uh, ministry as he's identified with God's plan for his life. Uh, 
The second baptism I talked about was in terms of a wet baptism. It was John's baptism. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So he's using water to signify cleansing, which is what takes place in terms of repentance towards God in preparation for the coming kingdom. In Matthew uh, three sixteen and 17, uh, this is a passage dealing with Jesus' baptism. Matthew twenty eight nineteen through twenty. This is when Jesus is uh, uh, Jesus gives a great commission to the disciples. Go therefore and make disciples. This is one of three times in Matthew. I pointed this out Sunday morning. It's so significant. I don't want you to forget it or miss it. Only three times in Matthew is the verb to make disciples used, and this is one of them. Uh, we hear a lot of people make a lot of issues out of making disciples and being disciple makers, but uh, not, de- not, not denying the significance. This is a word that's only used three times in the Gospels, one time in Acts. And people build entire ministries off of this. Not that it's not significant, but I don't think it's as significant as they've made it out to be. Go, therefore, and make disciples simply means to make students or learners. Make, you know, teach the word. How do you make somebody a learner of the Word? You teach the Word of God. You don't uh, give them a lot of, uh, you know, just a a lot of sermons just based on what makes them feel good, motivational talks, that kind of thing. Make disciples of all nations by, it's an instrumental, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is one of those cases where an effect is put for a cause. The effect is to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, this is not cannot be identified with the spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is talking about water baptism, believer's baptism. But in the early church, as signified in Acts 8 with the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch, it was normative that, the, that when you believed in Jesus, you were baptized almost immediately. It was not something that you waited for so Water baptism, which was viewed not as something that brought grace or made you savable or did anything for you other than as a teaching aid for, for your positional truth, your position in Christ, that was so closely linked in time to your, your conversion, your belief in Christ, that that's what this first section talks about is really evangelism, uh, t- leading people to Christ, and when they believe, they would be baptized. Second thing is you take these new converts and you teach them to observe, Jesus said, all things that I have commanded you. But so this is a command to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that command has not been rescinded. That command is for every single believer, and that's our action plan. So those are our three ritual baptisms, our three wet baptisms. Now, the five dry baptisms, to me, are the more interesting ones. I think the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the most interesting, of course. But they all have something to say and to teach related to spiritual truth. And the first of these is the baptism of Noah. This is one that is usually not on most people's lists. I've seen many lists of of baptisms, and normally uh, most of them list seven baptisms, and they forget this one. But this is a significant one because the baptism of Noah is used by Peter to teach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in the baptism of Noah, the people who got baptized were the only ones who didn't get wet. Everybody else got wet, but the people who got baptized into Noah were dry. So I'm talking about that generation of, uh, of Noah. They were disobedient. When the patient, or t- actually it's talking context, if I remember, it's talking about the fallen angels who were disobedient. When the patience of God identifies those fallen angels with the invasion of the sons of God who intermarried with the daughters of men in Genesis 6, uh, they were the ones who once were disobedient. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. Remember, God called Noah, gave him 120 years to preach the gospel throughout the whole world, and he didn't have a single convert. See, the ministry is hard because you can't quantify the results of the, of the ministry. And today we live in a world where everything has to be quantified. You go to work, you get assessments, you get annual reviews, all these things to measure how much you've done in the last year. But 
by those standards, Noah was a complete abject failure because he didn't have a single convert. Yet God said he passed with flying colors. He preached the gospel for 120 years, and not one person responded. That doesn't mean he was a failure. It doesn't mean he needed to go to Dale Carnegie's course on how to win friends and influence people. He didn't need to go read uh, Napoleon Hill to learn how to be a good salesman and get immersed in demonism. He didn't need to do any of those things. All he had to do was preach the gospel, and he was rejected. So when the patience of God, after 120 years, kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now the next verse is where we get into it. So I'll give it its own slide. And corresponding to that. Now the Greek word translated corresponding is this word antitupos. Now, tupas in Greek is a, is a thing or an example or a mold that is used to, to depict something. We, we bring it over into English as the word type. We hear about the type of Christ. Now, little kids, well, back before they had, uh, uh, back when they had typewriters, might get confused about talking about type, a type of Christ because that sounds like a typewriter. What kind of typewriter did Jesus have? Maybe a Remington. I don't know. But the anti-tupos is what it corresponded to. So you have the shadow or the foreshadowing event or person or image. For example, the Lamb of God, that was a type. It was a picture or an example of something in the future, which was Jesus. And so Jesus, as the Lamb of God, is the antitype. Okay, you have type, which is the picture, and then the antitype, which is the reality that it portrayed. So in this verse we said, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. So baptism now is an antitype. It's portrayed by something that happened in the days of Noah. Baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is what that looks like. You have the ark, and those who are in the ark are identified with Noah in the Old Testament, and that corresponds to a current baptism that Peter's talking about that now saves us, And it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. So so it's not talking about the literal, physical washing by water. Now, the antitype, B represents the antitype. That's the current baptism. And this looks, is, is foreshadowed by the type in the Old Testament, which was the ark. So there's an identification with Noah that, that took place. So, if B is the, the if B is the antitype, if B the antitype is a baptism, and it is, that's clearly stated, then that which it corresponds to, that's which pictures it, the original type, which is A, must also be a baptism. Now this is the way it's worded, it gets confusing, so people don't usually list this as a baptism, but it is. It's the baptism of Noah which pictures something. And it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but the appeal to God for a good conscience. In other words, it's that picture, it's the, the washing of baptism is a picture of the positional cleansing that takes place when a person trusts in Christ as Savior. And that's all that Peter is, is talking about here. And it's not that, and that is that washing of regeneration, that cleansing, is the, what happens during the event we refer to as the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit, when we're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. So what do we have? We have an immersion in uh, the Holy Spirit, in the sense that the Holy Spirit is the one that is used by Jesus to effect that cleansing. So that's the uh, immersion aspect. The identification is with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, so that uh, we come out of the water is a picture of entry, as Romans uh, Paul says in Romans 6, 3, and 4, is entry into a new life. That's the inauguration. See, i got all three eyes in there. Identification, um, immersion, identification, and inauguration. 
All three are there. So 1 Peter 3.21 is talking about that, uh, that literal, uh, that literal uh, baptism uh, or the spiritual baptism of, of God the Holy Spirit. So when, Paul, uh, excuse me, when Peter writes this and he says that the baptism that now saves you, he uses, Greek has two different words for now, and sometimes it's significant, sometimes they're synonymous and there's not really a difference, but in some places there's a significant difference. And in this case, it's a broader now. It's not like talking about now tonight. It's like talking about now in this age, in this generation, in this decade. It's a broader sense of now. And so this is talking about the, the church age. Now in this church age, we have this new baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter knew about this because he was there in Acts uh, 1.5 when Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them. Uh, he was there with the disciples who waited in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit descended, and <clears throat> he declared that this uh, prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, and he did so uh, in Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. That Jesus' prophecy in Acts 1 5 that the Spirit would come is later uh, described by Peter as having been fulfilled by Acts 11, verses 15 through uh, 17. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit never occurred in the Old Testament. That's the distinguishing feature of the church age. As we studied this in Romans 6, when we went through those first five or six verses in Romans 6, pointing out that, that the significance of this is that, that, in the sense that baptism now saves you, is that it is in that identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection that the power, the tyranny of the sin nature over us is broken. The sin nature isn't removed, but it is broken so that we can be sanctified. So that's why uh, uh, P- Peter is saying this, and I would say that the, uh, the, the emphasis there on, on sozo is talking about sanctification, not justification. That baptism, it's that identification uh, with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection breaks the power of the sin nature so that we can continue uh, to be sanctified and, and phase two salvation in the Christian life. Uh, Earl Rodmacher, who was a past president of a Western Conservative Baptist Seminary and a very strong advocate of free grace salvation and a strong advocate of understanding the three phases or stages of salvation, being saved from the penalty of sin when you trust in Christ, being saved from the power of sin, when you're in the uh, when in the spiritual life, and then being saved from the uh, presence of sin, sin at, at glorification, would often start off to kind of shock people a little bit into understanding this. He said, "Yeah, I was saved, and I was saved uh, when I was a little boy. I was saved uh, yesterday. I was saved this morning. I was saved this afternoon. I'm saved now. I'll be saved tomorrow." It's that second. That, that phase two use of save where we're continuing to be sanctified, that's the idea here. Because that baptism from the Holy Spirit breaks the power of the sin nature, we can grow and mature and we no longer have to live under the tyranny of the sin nature. That's Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 3. The baptism of the Holy Spirit never occurred before the day of Pentecost. So that, <clears throat> that breaking of the power of the sin nature... Never occurred to anybody in the old in, in the Old Testament. It didn't occur to Moses. It didn't occur to Abraham. It didn't occur to Daniel or Jeremiah or Isaiah or John the Baptist. None of them had their sin nature power broken, but we do because of the power of of the uh, Holy Spirit, the baptism by the Holy Spirit, which occurs at the instant of salvation. And so, <clears throat> this is what sets apart uh, the church age, uh, the church age believer. And it's depicted in the event of Noah's Ark that those who were identified with Noah are protected and preserved from God's judgment on everyone uh, around them. And so there's no judgment on those in the Ark, just as there's no judgment on uh, or condemnation on those who are are in Christ Jesus. So that's the first baptism, the first dry baptism, of the baptism of Noah. And then second, we have the baptism of Moses, the baptism of Moses. 
Uh, all were baptized. This is talking about the Israelites who crossed the Red Sea following Moses' leadership. They're, I, see, they're identified with Moses. They're identified with Moses, and it's an immersion, but it's a dry immersion because they are crossing the Red Sea, and they're going from Egypt over to Sinai, and in that process, they're being inaugurated into a new life as the new people of God. See there, once again, we get uh, identification, immersion, and um, our, our immersion, identification, and inauguration. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Note, I put those prepositions there for a purpose. When you're baptized into something with that preposition ace, that indicates the ultimate goal. When, when uh, uh, John the Baptist says that you'll be baptized I baptized by water, he uses the preposition in, and you're baptized for repentance, that uses the preposition ace. The goal uh, uh, of the baptism is identification into repentance. So here it's identification into Moses, and what's used to make that was the cloud, which symbolized the leadership presence of God, the Shekinah glory, and the sea, which is the Red Sea. So the baptism of Moses is identification with Moses in terms of his faith, following him through the Red Sea and emerging out the, on the eastern side where there was new life. Then we have the baptism of fire mentioned in Matthew 3, 11 and 12. Jesus said, I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. See, that's ace there in the Greek, to repentance. But he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you and here it's the preposition in. So just as the, the cloud and the sea were the means by the identi- of the identification with Moses, so the Holy Spirit and fire are the means of identification here. Jesus in the future is going to con- have two different baptisms, uh, one related to the Holy Spirit by means of the Holy Spirit, and the other by means of fire. Fire is a judgment, but it's also a picture of cleansing. So uh, verse 12 clarifies that, says his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. It's a picture of judgment. This is what occurs at the end of the tribulation period when the Lord returns at the second uh, advent. He will clean out the threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn. That's a picture of believers. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So that means he will destroy the unbelievers and bring judgment upon them. Uh, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, to, I mean, excuse me, baptism of the cross. Uh, Jesus said to them, uh, he's talking to John and James, and they want to uh, be identified with him. And he says, well, no, you don't, you don't want to uh, do that. He says, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? When you drink something, it becomes part of you. You're identifying with that. Uh, and be baptized, again, emphasizes identification, be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. Are you going to be identified with this identification? He said, uh, and they said, oh, yeah, not knowing what he's talking about. Yeah, we can do that. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. You'll be identified with suffering as I am. And with the baptism I'm baptized with, you will be baptized. And that is talking about about judgment. But the baptism of the cross is really Christ's identification with our sins in his judgment on the cross. Now that brings us to the last, the fifth of the dry baptisms, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's important for this chapter, so we'll wait and just go into this and cover the baptism of the Holy Spirit next time. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to go through these baptisms and to come to an understanding that baptism is important and significant for the spiritual life of the church age believer as a testimony and a picture of what transpired at the instant of salvation in terms of our um, identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection and our being placed in union with Christ so that everything from that moment on is new. We are new creatures in Christ. Father, we pray that you challenge us with what we've studied, that the action plan here is to be baptized and to put that into effect because this is what the Lord commanded. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.